As I've mentioned to you before, one of the things that I do is every Tuesday I go to Lexington Medical Center, and while I'm there, I go room to room and I visit a list of people in order to minister to them and share the gospel with them. Well, this Tuesday, I went by this particular room, and the woman's name was Patricia. Of course, that's my mother's name. And so I went in there, and I began to chat with this lady, and I could tell that she was very, very depressed. And she began to share her story with me of how she began to take on health issues. And then her husband left her. And then she went on to share that her daughter was struggling with addiction. And I could see the sadness in her heart, and... I presented her the gospel and I said, ma'am, would you like to receive Jesus Christ right now? And she said, yeah, I would. And so I grabbed her hand and I led her in the sinner's prayer. And then afterwards, I proceeded to tell her that God offers hope in the midst of our trials. Even though we go through suffering and I told her, I don't know why you're going through more suffering. And we all don't know why some people suffer more than others. It's just life circumstances. But I tried to give her hope and quote her scripture, and I told her to stay in the Word of God because it would give her strength. Well, that's what I want to talk about this morning is hope in the midst of suffering because we all go through suffering in our life. We all go through trials, and Peter is dealing with that very subject. So turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. If you need a Bible, raise your hand, and one of the ushers will give you a Bible. 1 Peter chapter 4, we want to specifically... Look at verses 12 through 19, and the title of this message is Hope in Suffering. Now, in this section, Peter is going to be dealing with suffering in general, but persecution in particular. Let me say that again. He's dealing with suffering in general. So this message will apply to any of the life circumstances that you find yourselves in, but it's specifically dealing with a form of suffering called persecution. If you remember, Peter wrote this letter in the 60s. Peter was an older man by now. He was going to die shortly by being crucified upside down. And he wrote to these beleaguered Christians trying to encourage them to remain true to the Lord Jesus Christ and to focus on the second coming. And he writes because many of them were being persecuted. Nero was on the throne. And as you know, Nero was a madman. Tradition says that he burnt Rome down and he fiddled while he did it and he needed a scapegoat and so he blamed the Christians and as a result, many Christians were basically thrown in the lion's den as it were. Some of them were actually wrapped in animal skins and they allowed the animals to attack them and as John has said several times, Nero would take Christians and he would roll them in pitch and then he would set them on fire And he would light up the road leading to his house with Christians that were on fire. He was a madman. And so Peter here, in the midst of their persecution, is writing to them, trying to give them encouragement in the midst of their suffering and to help them as they deal with this issue of persecution. Now, you and I know that persecution seems to be on the rise in our country. We kind of sense it as Christians that we are moving in that direction. And so, as always, this message is very, very relevant. And what Peter's going to do here is give us seven principles on how you and I can deal with suffering in general and persecution in particular. Let me share them with you this morning briefly. First of all, if you're going through suffering or persecution, the first principle is expect trials. Expect trials. Notice what he says in verse 12 of 1 Peter chapter 4. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised, there it is, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal. Why does he say fiery? Because Nero was burning Rome down, he was burning Christians. He says, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. Peter here says, Don't be surprised when you go through suffering or you experience persecution in your life. Now, as Christians, we often are. In fact, when we go through suffering, when we go through malignment and persecution, the first question we often ask is, God, why are you allowing this in my life? God, what did I do wrong? 
After all, God, I'm faithful. I go to church. I tithe. I try to treat my fellow man right. I'm in the Word of God on a regular basis. God, why am I going through this? And so even though we know that trials and persecutions are an inevitable part of the Christian life, many of us, when we go through them, we often get sucker punched. And we shouldn't be sucker punched because the Bible makes it very clear that if you and I are following the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to go through difficulty. We live in a fallen world with fallen people. There are thorns and thistles, and as a result, we are going to suffer. In fact, if you read Job chapter 5, verse 7, Job says this, man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. Notice he says man is born unto trouble. Jesus said in John 16, he says, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In James chapter 1, James says, consider it all joy, my brethren, not if, but when you encounter difficulties and troubles in your life. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, everyone who lives a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted. See, the Bible is replete with verses that basically tell us as Christians, we are going to suffer for our faith and we're going to go through difficulties in life. Christians lose their jobs. Christians lose their loved ones. Christians get cancer. Christians suffer from sickness. They experience financial loss. They experience conflict in relationships, and Christians experience persecution. We are not exempt. In fact, this week I was reading about one Iranian Christian, and he was talking about what the church goes through in Iran. Notice what he says up on the screen, and I'm quoting here. It is important to know that fellowship is extremely difficult to come by. Christians in Iran have dealt with it all people pretending to be Christians to spy on them, being fired from their jobs because of their faith, being attacked by family members because of their conversion, prosecution from the government, and many more unspeakable acts. He goes on to say, Christian fellowship and community is desperately needed, but difficult to find. Finally, Christians in Iran want to obey the command to share their faith, but it is illegal. Some believe the cost is too high but there are others who are willing to do and to risk it all to share their faith, end quote. See, this is the reality that they're dealing with in Iran, and he's making an acknowledgement that uh, this is the melu or the environment in which they live. It's just part and parcel of being a Christian in Iran. And I think for us in America, in the West, the reason why we struggle with expecting persecution and trials, we get sucker punched by them, is because we have bought into this, uh, into the church a false theology. I think we have a theology that associates the American dream with Christianity. In other words, I'm owed this type of life. And so we buy into a false theology, we have false expectations of God. God, if I obey you, I'm not gonna suffer. And listen, You and I are accustomed in our Christian life not to experience persecution because we've had a lot of privileges in the West and many of us take them for granted. In fact, Zane Pratt said the following, and I love this quote. He tells us in America why we have a different mindset. Quote, the comfortable experience of Christians in the West, that would be you and I, has actually been, look what he says, an anomaly in this regard. In other words, we're not the norm. What you and I have experienced is not the norm. Because of the Christian heritage of Western civilization combined with democratic freedoms and historic rule of law, Western Christians have largely been left alone for their faith. Even today, as Western nations become increasingly post-Christian and even anti-Christian, the opposition experienced by most Christians goes little beyond mockery. Most of us get maybe mocked for our faith, he says. However, there are signs that this, is, that this protected status may be changing. If it continues to do so, it will simply put Western Christians in the same boat as their brothers and sisters all over the world. Today, in Islamic, Hindu, and communist parts of the world, being a follower of Jesus means at best losing your job and being rejected by your family. At worst, it can mean imprisonment, beating, and even death. These things are being experienced all over the world right now by our brothers and sisters in Jesus, end quote. 
See, in the West, we're an anomaly. This kind of stuff is being experienced by a lot of Christians. And look, you and I know that we're starting to see the temperature raised when it comes to persecution. And so Peter says, expect it. Don't be surprised if in the years to come, America is going to turn and we are going to be persecuted for our faith. And the reason why you need to expect persecution, expect suffering, is so that you're not caught off guard. A second principle that Peter gives us here when we deal with trials and persecutions in life and that is we are to rejoice in trials. We are to rejoice in trials. Notice what he says in verse 13. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, here it is in the Greek, keep on rejoicing, present tense. You and I are to have an attitude of joy. You and I are to rejoice so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may experience exaltation. Notice Peter here says that you and I are to rejoice in the midst of our difficulty, whether it's suffering in general or persecution in particular. Now you say, well, wait a minute, isn't this somewhat sadistic? Why would a Christian rejoice and glorify God in the midst of their difficulty and suffering? It seems counterintuitive. It seems like we would mope around and not rejoice. Well, Peter here gives us two reasons why you and I need to rejoice whenever we go through difficulties in life. The first reason is we participate in the sufferings of Christ. Look at verse 13. He says, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ. Remember what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 that he wanted to suffer like Christ suffered? Why? Because what that does is it produces intimacy in the relationship. If you want to grow in your walk with God, if I want to grow, even though our flesh doesn't like this, one of the greatest ways to develop intimacy with God is when you go through suffering. Why? Because you're able to identify with the sufferings of Christ. You're able to enter into intimate fellowship with Christ. And so we rejoice in our difficulties, not for the difficulty itself. James 1 says, count it all joy. We don't count it all joy for the difficulty itself, but we rejoice in our sufferings. And by the way, that's often an act of your will because sometimes, many times, you're not going to feel like rejoicing. It's a lot easier to complain. It's a lot easier to grumble. We make a decision to rejoice. Why? Because I'm participating in the sufferings of Christ and I'm able to fellowship with him in a deeper way. Another reason why he says we rejoice is because we will receive greater reward. Notice what he says in verse 13, but to the degree, and I want you to circle that word, to the degree, because what he's doing here is he's making a comparison between our sufferings that we suffer in this life for Christ and the rewards that we will receive in heaven. He says, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, and here it is, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice, and this is a strong word in the Greek, with exaltation. This isn't just a happy exaltation, this is an exaggerated exaltation. This is rejoicing in a superlative way. In other words, his point is this, the more you suffer in this life, what happens is when Jesus Christ comes back, or you die first and go to heaven your joy is going to be that much greater. And you know what? I never really understood that until I started watching a series of uh, episodes on TV called I Should Not Be Alive. Laura and I have been watching this. This program, you can look at it at Amazon, is absolutely fabulous. It documents true stories of people that have experienced extreme circumstances in their life. And when they're on the brink of death, they get rescued at the last minute. In fact, one guy we watched, they were doing uh, this mountain. I think they were climbing up the Himalayas. And when they were coming down, one of the things that uh, you have to watch for if you're a mountaineer is these crevices that are in the snow. You could be walking, and all of a sudden, there's this huge precipitous drop. Well, these two guys were best friends, and they were walking, and they fell down this crevice. It was about an 80-foot drop. And actually, it was deeper, but there was a ledge that they actually landed on. And the one friend died on impact. 
The other friend had to scale the wall, which was about 80 80 feet high, in order to get to the top because the temperatures were going to get below 30, below zero. And so he had to scale this wall. And it took every bit of strength to get out of that situation. But here's what we noticed. In every one of these situations, when there was extreme suffering, when there was extreme difficulty, and all the victims were on the brink of giving up hope and they were going to die, right at the last minute they were rescued, and when the rescuers came to get them, you should see the look on their face. They were overjoyed. They were filled with exaltation. They were like, hallelujah. Why? Because the more suffering, the greater joy when you're rescued out of that suffering. Without fail, every one of those individuals that were suffering were so happy when they were rescued. And that's the point Peter is making. We rejoice. Why? Because we share in the sufferings of Christ, but also we're going to receive a greater reward. We're going to experience a greater rejoicing when we get to heaven. You think the Christians in North Korea, they only have Christ. That's all that they have. They don't have the material goods of this world. But I'll tell you what, when they die and they go to heaven, their joy is going to be that much greater. Why? Because they've suffered more in this life. And so Peter says, rejoice in your trials. That is an act of your will. It is a choice. It is a perspective that we all have to keep. And why do we rejoice? Because we participate in the sufferings of Christ. And secondly, we'll receive a greater reward. There's a third response that we need to have when we suffer difficulty in trials, and that is this. Depend on God's spirit in trials. Depend on God's spirit in trials. Notice, if you will, verse 14. He says, if you are reviled, and that word reviled means to be spoken evil of. If you are reviled for the name of Christ... You are blessed. Many times we see ourselves as cursed, but Peter says we are blessed. Why? Here it is. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Peter is saying here that whenever you go through difficulties or persecutions, Peter is saying the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now, this imagery is taken from the Old Testament. Do you remember when God dwelt In the tabernacle, his glory presence dwelt there, and also in the temple. And the Bible says that you and I now in the New Testament are the temple of God. We have the Spirit of God living on the inside of us. And I believe that when you and I go through difficulties and sufferings in life, especially persecutions when we're standing for the name of Christ and we're reviled, there is a unique sense in which the Holy Spirit strengthens us, enables us, and gives us boldness. Remember Peter in Acts chapter 7 when he was preaching to that angry mob? What happened when he began to preach to them? It says that his face looked like the angel of God. I believe the spirit of glory and of God rested upon him. See, you and I need strength when we go through difficulties. We cannot get through them in our own strength. There are some challenges in life that test us beyond the limit. And we need God's grace. We got to get on our knees and say, God, I cannot do this. I need your spirit and your power right now to either deliver me out of this trial or to sustain me in the midst of the trial. You see, we're blessed because we have the power of the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom, to give us insight, to give us power, and to give us strength. How many of you have ever been on your face before God and you felt so broken? You said, God, I don't even know what to pray right now. The Spirit has to intercede for me, Romans chapter 8, because the Spirit knows exactly what I'm feeling, and the Spirit takes what I'm feeling and translates it back to God. You see, that's the role and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. There have been many throughout church history that when they were being martyred for their faith, the Spirit of glory and of God gave them extra measure in order to get through that persecution. I'm thinking particularly of a man by the name of Polycarp. Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna. Now, Smyrna, if you remember, was the church addressed in Revelation chapter 2. Polycarp was the pastor of that church. And we know from church tradition that Polycarp was actually discipled by the Apostle John. Well, persecution had broken out in the early church. This is after the uh, apostles had died. It's probably first century when Polycarp was living. 
persecution broke out against the church and they decided to arrest Polycarp because he was the ringleader of the Christian movement. And when they finally gathered him, he said three nights before he got arrested, God gave him a vision. And in the vision, he saw his pillow burning with fire. And he told his friends, I'm going to be burned alive. God gave him a warning of what was coming. So they arrested him, they took him to the arena, and they said, we're going to give you a chance to deny God and worship Caesar. Because they believed that the Christians were atheists, because we worship a God we can't see. So they said, we're going to give you a chance to deny God and demonstrate your loyalty towards Caesar. And he looked at the crowd, and he said to them, away with you atheists. And then they threatened to throw him to the lions. He wasn't deterred. Finally, they built a huge thing of wood, and they lit him up on fire. And here is what one of the biographers said that was around in that day. They wrote it down. Here is what they saw when it happened. And by the way, here is what he said to the people when they said, we're going to burn you to death. He said this, quote, 86 years have I served Christ and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And so they lit it, and it says this, quote, the fire shaped itself in the form of an arch, like the sail of a ship when filled with the wind, and formed a circle around the body of the martyr. Inside it, he looked not like flesh that is burnt, but like bread that is baked, or gold and silver glowing in a furnace. And we smelt a sweet scent like frankincense or some precious spices, end quote. When he got martyred, they said the smell was not burning flesh. It was like frankincense. And they said the way the fire shaped itself was like a cone. God was demonstrating his glory when Polycarp was martyred. You see, that's the spirit of glory and of God. And you know what? That is available to you and I when we go through suffering. We must depend upon the power of God's spirit. Well, there's a fourth principle that Peter gives here, and that is this. We must evaluate our trials. We must evaluate our trials. Notice, if you will, verse 15. He says, make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, as a thief, an evildoer, or a trouble some meddler. Peter says, look, if you're going to suffer, you need to evaluate your suffering. Why are you going through your suffering? Why are you being persecuted for your faith? He says, make sure it's not a self-inflicted wound. Make sure it's not because you murdered somebody. If you murder somebody and go to jail, don't say I'm suffering for the cause of Christ. If you steal something, if you're an evildoer, or a troublesome meddler, which, by the way, means someone who interferes in the affairs of other people. It's also used of a revolutionary. If you're suffering in your life because you made a bonehead decision, don't blame God. What he's saying is make sure that you are suffering because you're a Christian. Evaluate, why am I going through this? Because what happens is a lot of Christians, they go through suffering because they've made bad decisions. Now, here's the good news. God can take your bad decision, he can use it for his glory, and he can use it for your good, and God will be glorified in the midst of that. However, you need to remember that if you suffer, it doesn't need to be a self-inflicted wound. I was reading a story this week about a man who basically called the cops because he said he had been shot. He was at a hotel in Virginia, and so the cops came... And this particular man who was shot in the leg claimed that two men shot him. He ran into them, and they got in an altercation, and one of the men had shot him. Well, the police began to do some investigating, and they found out that this man actually had taken a gun, and he actually had shot himself in the leg, and he filled out a false police report. And so they ended up arresting him. They found the gun in the hotel room. You know what he suffered? A self-inflicted gun wound. And that's what happens to a lot of Christians. They basically suffer because of a self-inflicted gun wound. 
And some Christians bring on suffering needlessly. Do you remember this guy back in the 90s, Fred Phelps? Notice the sign up here. Do you remember this guy that would stand up at Westboro Baptist Church in Kansas City? Whenever there was somebody who died, an American soldier, this church would go to the area and they would protest. Look at this other one. It says, fags doom nations, plane crash, God laughs. And you know what they would do? They would go around and they would put this stuff out. And you know what they were doing? They were basically bringing on persecution needlessly. See, Peter says not to do that. He says, evaluate your suffering. Well, there's a fifth principle that he gives here, and that is this, be bold in your trials. Be bold in your trials. Notice what he says in verse 16. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, and by the word, way that word Christian there is used only three times in the Bible. He says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. Notice he says here that we're to be bold in our trials. We are to be bold in our persecutions. We are not to be ashamed. We are to be willing to stand for Christ. And you know, I've asked myself this question. If persecution really broke out in America, would I be willing to take a stand? And you know, there are times where I feel very bold, and I feel like no matter what happens, I would be willing to take a stand. But to be honest with you, there are other times where I think to myself, man, if I was to be arrested and I was to be tortured for my faith, would I be willing to take a stand? If someone said to me, Mike Nimmer, if you don't deny Jesus Christ, we're going to cut your tongue out. By the way, that happened to a lot of Christians in the first century and throughout the history of the church. And as I began to think about that, I began to think, Lord, I don't know what I would do. I don't know if I would have the strength. That's why I'd have to have the spirit of glory and of God. And Peter says here, don't be ashamed that you are a Christian. In other words, you need to bear that name as a sign, as a badge, whereby you are proud to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed, he says, but praise God that you bear that name. You know what he's saying? He's saying be bold in your faith. In other words, be a person of conviction, and this is what we're needing in our time for all of us. As we face deeper waters in America, it is imperative that Christians stand for their faith. And listen, you're not going to be bold in your trials when you go through persecution if you're not walking with God on a regular basis. If you don't lay that foundation by being in the Word and in prayer, when the trial comes, when the winds blow, when the water begins to come down, you know what's going to happen? Your superstructure is going to crash. Why? Because you didn't have a solid foundation. One of the guys that I love is Richard Wombrand. You'll notice his picture up on the screen. He was married to a woman named Sabino Wombrand. They were in communist Romania uh, in the 90s and in the 80s. And while they were there, Stalin had come in and they had taken over uh, Romania. And Romania had become communistic in nature. And so a lot of the pastors were beginning to sell out and they were beginning to give their allegiance to Joseph Stalin and the whole communist regime there. Well, they were having this religious convention for all pastors and all religious people. And during the meeting, a number of pastors stood up and they gave their loyalty to Stalin. Well, what was Richard Wimbrand going to do? He was beginning to equivocate and here is what his wife said to him, quote, Richard, stand up and wash away this shame from the face of Christ. They are spitting in his face. I said to her, if I do so, you'll lose your husband. She replied, I don't wish to have a coward as a husband, end quote. I'd be like, thanks, woman. Appreciate that. <laughs> so you know what he did? He got up because he was one of the speakers, and everyone thought he was going to get up before all the communists and all of the pastors that sold out. He stood behind the podium, and listen, this was on national TV in Romania, and he said, our loyalty is to Christ and not Joseph Stalin. And you know what happened? They freaked out, 
and they immediately tried to get him off the TV set. He escaped, and listen to this. He was in prison for 14 years. Three of those years were in solitary confinement. That's suffering. That's being bold. And I'll tell you what, there are times where God calls me to be bold and share my faith, and you know what? I'm not bold. You ever been there before? We have an opportunity to share Christ and you don't. I've been there before. And then there are other times where I'm very bold. There's a sixth principle as we wind down here on how to deal with trials and persecution. And that is this, be purified by trials. Notice what he says in verse 17 and 18. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. In other words, God is going to chastise his people. That's the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And then he's going to quote here Proverbs 11:31, in verse 18, and if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? You know what he's doing here? He's making a comparison between the sinner and the saint. He's making a comparison between time and eternity. And he's saying this, if judgment begins with the house of God, in other words, God deals with his people first, and what does he do? He judges them. What does that mean? He purifies the church. And Peter makes a comparison, and he says this, if God purifies and judges his people first, what do you think he's going to do to the non-believer that rejects the gospel? If God deals with his own people by purifying them and chastising them, what do you think God is going to do with the non-believer that rejects the gospel of God? And you know what Peter is saying here? One of the purposes of trials is God purifies us in the midst of our difficulty and our suffering. We don't like to go through suffering, but you know what suffering does? You know what persecution does? It weans us from the world. Persecution and suffering forces us to be more dependent upon God. We tend to draw closer to God in the midst of our suffering and difficulty. And listen, if God is going to judge America, and I don't know the mind of God, but you know where God is going to start first? He's going to start with the American church. He's going to start with the church in Europe. He's going to start with the church in some parts overseas. Why? Because judgment begins with the house of God. Do you realize to a certain extent One of the reasons why we're having the problems that we're having in America is because the church has failed to be the church. The church is not being salt and light. We have become like the world. And so what happens is God has to purify through the power of the Holy Spirit. He purifies his church by bringing persecution and suffering. You know what it does? It separates the wheat from the tares. And so so you know what Peter says? He says, allow the trial to refine you. Allow the trial to do what it was designed to do. Well, there's one other principle that Peter gives here. If you and I are going to endure suffering and difficulty and persecution, and that is this. We need to trust God in the trial. We need to trust God in the trial. Notice, if you will, verse 19. He says, therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to their faithful creator in doing what is right. Peter here says, when you go through difficulty, trust God. Now, why is that hard to do? A lot of times, we don't know what God is up to. Sometimes we can't see the hand of God. But we have to remember this. What you meant for evil, God meant for what? For good. And one of the hardest things, and this is where Satan attacks us, don't trust God. Did God really say, the longer we suffer, the harder it is to trust God? Because sometimes we don't see the big picture. And we say, God, why are you allowing this in my life? God, why are you not answering my prayer? And Peter says, don't get angry at God. Don't get mad at God. He says, those who suffer according to the will of God, keep entrusting yourself to God. And what? Continue to do what is right. Continue to serve God. You see, we got to sink our roots deep. Do you remember the movie Twister? 
All of us probably saw the movie Twister. Do you remember that last scene when the couple there up on the screen, Helen Hunt, I can't remember his name, he's passed away since then, but do you remember they went into that barn and that barn was filled with knives? And remember that tornado was coming? And so what did they do? If you'll notice on the right, they took a strap, a leather strap, and there was this pipe that was driven deep into the ground. It was a well or something. And they took the strap that was made out of leather, they wrapped it around their bodies, and then they wrapped it around the pipes that were driven deep into the ground. And when the tornado hit, they were able to see inside the tornado. Why didn't they get sucked up? Because they were firmly attached to the pipe. And you know what? When you and I go through trials, we need to take the leather belt, as it were, and we need to strap ourselves to God. Why? Because in the midst of the tornado, in the midst of the storm, God is the one that sustains us. He is the one that strengthens us, but we have to trust him. And listen, I know that's not always easy. Many times we argue with God, we complain to God, we get angry at God, but God wants us to get on our face and say, God, I don't understand this. I can't see your hand, but God, I trust your heart. And so how do we respond to suffering and difficulty, persecutions? Peter here has given us hope in the midst of suffering. What are we to do? He says we're to expect trials. Secondly, we're to rejoice in trials. Thirdly, we're to depend on God's spirit in trials. Fourthly, we're to evaluate our trials. Fifthly, we're to be bold in trials. Sixth, we are to be purified by trials. And then finally, we are to trust God in the midst of our trials. Let's pray.